Uh, thank you for a more than generous introduction. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for, um, for being here and for being part of an enterprise which I think has yielded some really exciting um, science, um, insights, ideas, and, um, and a lot of momentum uh, for uh, a different way of thinking about the microbial world and about ourselves as well. And so what I hope to do um, in the next bit of time is to talk a little bit about um, some of the history and some of the ideas that have led to our current perspective on humanness and our relationship to the microbial world, um, and tell you a little bit about the themes that are shown here, diversity, stability, and resilience, but mindful of the fact that many more will follow me, um, many of whom are, are more than qualified to talk on any of these topics, and so I will um, hope to simply introduce some of these um, items for you. I want to just start by um, reminding all of us that our perspective on the microbial world has been very much colored by history and by overt events that, that draw attention to themselves, such as um, pestilence and, and pandemics. This is actually a painting of Bethesda in the 1940s. Um, uh, not really, but, um, but might have been, actually. Uh, but it, it is a reminder of, of the way in which we have become aware of, of microbes around us and what that means for even the language about how we talk about our relationships with the microbial world. The fact is, though, that, that microbes um, almost uh, to, 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 to the single microbe on the planet um, live in communities and, and engage in beneficial activities. Um, this is the rule. Um, the last is, is very much the exception. And despite all of that, um, even today, we still are gripped with fear and anxiety about the microbial world. And I don't mean we in this room, but, but our colleagues and, and family members um, out I across the planet, and certainly in, in this culture. Uh, you may not be able to read the caption, but it's, um, I see it, um, but it scampers away from the light. And I, it, there's still this, this mindset that um, the only good microbe is a dead one, and that we mostly have much to fear and not much to, to gain from an encounter. This has been brought to light in a number of fora, and I just wanted to highlight a few because this does have some history, and it's sometimes well worth reading. This is um, a work by Theodore Rosebery, published this book in 1969. It's a wonderful book. Um, by, in fact, the man for whom the wonderful genus of bacteria, Roseburia, was named, the, the great butyrate producers in the human colon. Um, but Roseburia was, a, many, in many ways, a pioneer and pointed out what I think we now recognize, at least those of us in this room, that in this nation and others, especially in the developed world, um, we are now um, a population of tub-scrubbed and uh, deodorized neurotics. And, um, and he talks a lot about the, the vastly more beneficial kinds of relationships we have with the microbial world than, than we do with uh, the harmful kind. Um, in fact, really takes this a bit further and talks about um, psychopathology and, and maybe its role in the origins of our thinking about fear and, and loathing of the microbial world, um, talking a lot about um, anal retentiveness and anal neuroses and cites Freud in, in, for a number of chapters. Um, well worth reading. Another bit of, of history, and I don't mean to, uh, to dwell on this, but um, of course the first observations of the human microbiome go back to 1683 and, and, and then have an interesting and checkered history through the subsequent centuries, including, um, I think, the important reference to an observation that was made in the 1930s, so-called the Great Plate Anomaly, where there was a, uh, an obvious disconnect between the number of cells that could be seen under a microscope and the number that could be grown and recovered as colonies on a plate. And this then, I think, in my mind anyway, led to um, an application to habitats of greater familiarity to us, such as human. Rene Dubot, in fact, uh, in the 1960s, talked about the communities of organisms in the human body and their co-evolution over time with us. And then shortly thereafter, again, the application of these older microbiological concepts 
to the human body with um, Moore's work right here in, outside in Virginia uh, at VPI, um, and then uh, Dwayne Savage and his work and others in showing us that there were in fact so many more microbial cells associated with human uh, than one might have thought. In fact, many more than we have cells of our own human kind. Um, in fact, the 10 to 1 ratio comes from the 1970s. So why the interest today in, in the human microbiome? I would argue there are probably several factors, um, one of which is this growing, strong, compelling sense that these microbial communities that make the human their home are a critical component of human biology. Uh, there is, of course, the, the growing uh, evidence that these communities play roles in health, but also in disease, and we're now understanding that better. There's also cl the clear evidence that these communities um, help to determine an aspect of human individuality. And that's, of course, a fundamental interest to many of us, not only as clinicians, but simply as, as living, being, sentient entities. And, and then, as you have already heard from Dr. Collins, um, the, the whole notion that we are a collective um, and a meaningful collective, not a random collective, as, as I and many others will uh, point out. Another factor is, is the opportunity to um, engage in approaches that would be, uh, provide novel therapeutics or preventive measures, and the opportunity to apply what are now some, some very exciting um, kinds of science and ways of thinking to a topic that, as I have just pointed out, is really an ancient topic, but it's a convergence of, of disciplines, of technologies, um, and of concepts. So, the benefits that we now um, ascribe to our microbiota are numerous. These are, are, are some. They are familiar to many of you. Uh, some of these may be less familiar, and all of these will be addressed in subsequent talks, especially uh, later today and tomorrow. So I certainly won't dwell on these, um, but simply remind you of some of the somewhat surprising aspects of what it is to have um, hu human physiologic properties that in fact can be um, written or, or attributed to the microbial world that lives within us. The other part of, of true commensalism, uh, or mutualism rather, is the, the two-way benefit aspect. And this is a part that we haven't talked about so much. That is, the benefits that our communities derive from living within us. Um, they can be encapsulated in these three areas, um, nutrition, habitat, dispersal. But there probably is much more that we could uh, learn and should be learning, in fact, about the benefits that they derive. Because, of course, if you believe in at least half of the last slide and those attributes, then it would behoove us to understand what it might take to nurture and sustain the communities that are providing these benefits to us. I mentioned the idea of, of disease association with the microbiome. This is an area that, as you all well know, is um, very much in the, um, in the forefront today uh, and certainly has led to a lot of associations where the idea might be that instead of a single organism as the pathogen, it's the net effect of a community which has now become disturbed in some fashion. And I think we have some evidence for such a concept in, in certain settings um, and less in others, of course. Uh, here are some that are associated, but I will just hasten to remind all of us as we um, sort of strive to understand what might be the, the other uh, members of, of, a, of a list like this, that, that in fact the issue here is um, how do, we, how do we clarify the nature of these associations? Uh, can we, in fact, impute a causative role to these communities, these disturbed communities? Or, in fact, are they the, uh, the result of pathology that was produced or created by some other means? Um, or, in fact, is there no um, relationship, meaningful relationship, direct relationship, between pathology and, and an altered microbiota. And I think all of those three possibilities in that top line are certainly possible for some of those disease states, as is the idea that if there were a causal relationship, 
it might be of one of several different kinds, including the, um, the role in initiating pathology as well as um, a role in simply propagating or contributing to ongoing pathology, which I think is much more clearly um, a possibility in some of those disease states, such as inflammatory bowel disease or any situation in which for whatever the reason, one has an inflamed environment and now you have selection for certain clades of organisms that do very well, that compete very well in those conditions like the gamma proteobacteria. Um, and they then now begin to propagate their own form of inflammation for their own benefit, but also um, as a, as a uh, contributor to the pathology. And then remember, if there is a causal role, either in initiating or propagating, um, the community may not have a necessary role. It may not even have a sufficient role. Um, it may be neither and still be contributory. So this is clearly a complex area. I think it's one that certainly deserves a lot more thought right now about how to address these important questions. I, uh, in thinking about um, getting up here at the beginning of the first day, um, worried about terminology. I, I have this funny feeling in gazing out and seeing a lot of familiar faces that um, some of these terms may be very well known to, to most of you. So um, perhaps those for whom these are not so familiar can read these faster than I can read them. Uh, but I just want to point out that much of what we know today is based upon one way of looking at a complex community. Um, that is um, using a method that, that um, infers something about the phylogenetic or taxonomic composition of a community rather than some of the other features. And this is, of course, because approaches like 16S or other marker gene-based survey um, capabilities are among the capabilities most available and easiest to apply to many samples. But remember that there are other approaches. Um, many of you are, of course, leaders in these other approaches but they include the means of assessing genetic potential or functional potential by doing metagenomic analyses, um, as well as other kinds of so-called downstream uh, genomic approaches, all of which get us a little bit closer to what's actually happening in the way of function, but don't quite get us all the way there. And, and that's something that I cer certainly will um, remind all of us about towards the end as, we, as I get to my goals and needs and challenges. So the questions that, that I want to uh, address very briefly are um, the nature of the relationships between diversity and states of health. Of course, disease matters here as well. I'm going to spend more time on health. How and to what degree is the microbiota stable? What do we mean by stability, really? Um, and especially during adulthood, I, um, in looking at the program and making certain assumptions, thought perhaps that Ruth Lay, who follows me, would talk about childhood, and that may or may not be the case, but um, anyway. Um, and then thirdly, uh, is the microbiota and the microbiome resilient, meaning how well is it able to absorb a disturbance and recover or sustain its original functions? So first, a little bit about diversity. Again, mindful that you're going to hear much more about this. I start with, 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 I think, what is a, a pretty simple question, but it has a complex answer. Because when one thinks about diversity and biology, you have to ask, well, what is the aspect of diversity that might matter? Uh, and, and how might you go about measuring that? So are we, do we care about individual organisms, meaning, say, strains or single cells? Do we care about clades of organisms? Uh, do we care about their more fundamental features, like their genes, or their pathways, or their products, or their activities? And are we talking, in some cases, really about the community as a net sum entity, um, and really interested more in the comparisons between communities, or between populations of hosts that bear multiple kinds of communities? Uh, and then there's the issue of abundance, and I think the answer is yes. It, it really depends upon what it is that we're trying to understand that then determines what aspect of all of this diversity we might be most interested in measuring. Now, what we see most are, are um, assessments of, of diversity that, again, take the taxonomic or phylogenetic compositional approach and classify at high levels of the taxonomic um, scheme. 
meaning at the phylum level. And, and that's, of course, because it's the easiest and, uh, and the most straightforward and for which, the thing for which we have great reference databases. And so you end up with pie charts and stack bar graphs and, and other assessments of compositional state based upon the, the phylogenetic composition. And in this case, it's phylum. And it's color-coded by phylum. And it makes the simple point that uh, despite the fact that on the planet around us, there might be something on the order of 100 phyla level uh, categories of organisms, there are many, many fewer of those categories, the phylum categories, within the human body. You see some of the similar colors across body sites, but it's still a low number in total. And it simply you know, begs the question, well, why? What is it about being a human that, that leads to a very select subset of bacterial, in this case, bacterial diversity, that, um, that is found within the human body. And I'll mention here something I glossed over, which is that when we talk about diversity, we're certainly interested in more than just the bacteria. Uh, we're interested in viruses, as you will hear about later today. We're interested in archaea, which, about which we know something, and we're interested in microscopic eukarya as well. But, but again, everything is not everywhere. And even when one talks about body sites or ha body habitats, this is a study from 2009 from Rob Knight's group, uh, Liz Costello, and um, was in fact uh, one of the first or the first to use modern techniques for assessing phylogenetic composition and then sampled on the same day multiple body sites within the same healthy individuals. These are adults. The clustering is, is color-coded based on habitat, body site. And what this tells us is that there is a very distinct compositional state at each of the major anatomic regions of the human body. Um, and you've already seen this many times and, and heard it just this morning already. Even within these so-called body regions or body sites, there are um, categories of habitats that might not have been apparent um, by just simply gazing at an anatomy textbook. This is work from Julie Segre, as you well know, showed that the skin can be divided into three kinds of habitats, perhaps as distinct um, as would be desert, grassland, and forest to a plant ecologist. But in this case, it's sebaceous, dry, and moist. Now, of course, uh, clinicians know something about these clinical categories as well, but they also know that there are disease associations that track with these kinds of skin habitats. And this sort of work in, in understanding biogeography may have some important connections to our understanding of disease propensity, disease location, and disease causation uh, with the possibility of interventions. I mentioned that, that Really, there are many lenses with which to look at diversity, and this is a, a point well made in one of the HMP consortium papers from last year. Um, this figure, and all you need to see is color, on the top set of panels looks at body site, each of those major panels going left to right, and multiple individuals at each of these uh, body sites, and those are the small little columns within each of the panels. The top set of panels shows a great deal of variation in the compositional state when looking at phylogenetic composition. The bottom set of panels are the same habitats and the same individuals and the same samples, but they were sequenced using a metagenomic approach, and now they're assessing, in a sort of high-level fashion, the genetic uh, potential or um, the functional categories that are, uh, that are inferred from metagenomic data again, for the same samples and body sites. And what you see on the bottom is a much more even swath of color based upon these categories of genes. And that tells us that even though there appears to be a great deal of, of diversity at the level of taxon, strain, species, genus, as shown here, there is perhaps more even um, distribution of diversity at the level of genetic potential. Now, uh, Curtis Huttenhauer, who will speak later today, will tell us a little bit, I think, about um, the, the, the insights that are revealed from work of this sort that now tell us a little bit about what is it about each of these body sites 
that either selects for or allows certain clades of organisms to do their things, to demonstrate these different features of genetic potential, because there is uh, sort of segregation by body site with respect to the kinds of pathways and gene types that are, um, that are displayed by the organism found there. This color coding is based on body site, and it reflects modules of genetic potential. Um, that tattoo is actually um, a, a tattoo that, that Dr. Collins proudly displays. Um, no, not really. Uh, so just to summarize, um, what are the sources of, of variation diversity? Well, it's body site, habitat. It's individual. Um, data I haven't shown. It's the health status of that individual. Are they healthy? Are they sick? In what way are they sick? Um, it's genetics, which is of course part of individual, but um, so is environmental exposures and environmental history and life history. And that encompasses these other features, and that's all a part of what it is to be an individual, um, having been born with a certain genetic um, complement and then experiencing life in whatever ways and whatever places one does. So what about um, stability? How and to what degree is the microbiota stable? Um, what's the relationship of stability to age, uh, age of the host, and to immunocompetence? Uh, what are the determinants of stability, and what do we really mean by uh, stability, to come back to an earlier question? Um, at the risk of, of maybe overplaying a certain kind of, of imagery, um, but because I think it's, it's useful, nonetheless, um, I'm showing you a, a fitness or a, or a stability landscape, something that ecologists like to think about and use as a way of visualizing the state of an ecosystem. The ecosystem is in some ways um, displayed as, as a circle here um, with a community and its position on this landscape is a reflection of how stable it is or is believed to be at that given time. The deeper one of these valleys might be, and the steeper the walls and the more narrow, um, the more stable is the community. But the landscape is not just one valley, it's many. And the, and the terrain that, that separates valleys um, is varied and variable. Uh, and so there may be multiple stable states, called alternative stable states, and they may be also associated with health or with disease. Um, but when we begin to think about stability and resilience, um, it's this kind of, of notional idea that, that I think helps to uh, help us to understand what it is we need to know, even in the clinic, as I will end with. Now, um, despite the, um, the significant, important contributions of, of the first phase of HMP. Um, it provided relatively limited views of, of temporal stability. There were only a few time points selected, at least in the, um, the initial set of 300 subjects. Uh, there are, in fact, um, some important but very limited examples of dense time series of sampling of humans, and um, I just want to show you a few. This is a study some of you know well. It's, again, work of Rob Knights, Greg Caparoso in his lab, um, published two years ago. Two adults sampled daily, um, as you can read, six and 15 months, respectively. And they were sampled at each of these three kinds of body sites. The blue is uh, gut, fecal samples, or poop samples, as we like to say. Um, the green, uh, tongue swab samples. And then the bottom yellow and reddish and orange is uh, skin, palm, palm swabs. The, uh, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is uh, principal component one, the value of um, any given community uh, along that particular projection of the variability in the data. So for those of you familiar with principal coordinates analyses, this is uh, old hat. For those of you not, um, the position here, at least on the y-axis in this display, and I've already shown you a few of these other displays in two dimensions, um, indicates the relative relationship of one community to another with respect to, in this case, its phylogenetic composition overall and the, and the, and the uh, branch length within each of the communities and, its, and the differences. So this figure from the paper 
suggests that body habitat is um, coherent over time. That's nice to know, reassuring. Um, it also shows some variability uh, on a shorter time scale, uh, and, and it shows relative degrees of variability between each of these sites, skin showing greater degree of variability, for example. Now, um, if one looks at the same data in a slightly different way, in this case, by plotting on the x-axis time interval, so this is the interval between uh, any two samples, pairs of samples, and the y is again an ecologic distance measurement. In this case, it's uh, the Bray Curtis or a derivative of the Bray Curtis distance. Um, now one sees, instead of a relatively flat line, um, a, a, a gradual upslope. And the upslope indicates the apparent increasing dissimilarity between any two communities the further apart in time they are. Now these are adults, and these are the data from the stool samples, um, but the same is true for the tongue and for the skin. The slopes are slightly different. This slope is the steepest, by the way. It suggests the possibility, in any case, this is just two people and one way of looking at the data, but it suggests the possibility that there's drift in the compositional state of the microbiota during adulthood. Now, you may ask, well, maybe it doesn't really matter, and, and it might not, but um, this is another way of looking at the data now color-coded by 45-day period during the course of collection. And the first 45 days is the red towards the top. And you can see this arrow that time is causing um, a shift in the position of the fecal communities downward and a little bit towards the right. But interestingly, it's also showing a much more transient, much more dramatic excursions of the compositional state out towards the left within any 45-day period. There are a few days here and there when the community is very different, meaning a much different PC1 coordinate score than it typically has. And I'll just tell you that when you look at the organisms that drive the separation of samples on this display, it's um, along PC1, it's a Bacteroides predominance that takes you to the right, and a Prevotella and related organism dominance that takes you to the left. So this would suggest that in a one given healthy adult, uh, during the course of a week, there might be a day or two when instead of having a Bacteroides dominant microbiota, there's a Prevotella dominant microbiota. And for those aficionados, this has some significance since these are the dominant types that help define um, some of the so-called enterotypes. So we may have a, um, a, a tendency towards one dominant type, but we may spend days, a few days here and there, um, with a different type for reasons that at least um, here are not so clear. This issue of stability has, of course, been addressed um, by others and most recently by Jeremiah Faith and Jeff Gordon's lab um, in this paper that's already been highlighted this morning. And here um, one sees uh, a decay in the degree to which um, one sample shares strains with another sample within the same individual um, across increasing time intervals. But you can see this downslope tends to flatten off. And um, in fact, it follows a power law um, distribution, um, such that one can make a prediction about how many strains might be shared um, within an individual if one were to look out over time intervals longer than the maximum here, which is about five years, um, and suggest that in this particular case, through this particular lens of identifying strains, that an individual probably retains um, a fair number of strains over long periods of time, which is, a, again, an important concept and one that, of course, certainly bears um, corroboration and further study. Strains probably are an important way of, of looking at diversity, as I've already suggested, perhaps, um, in my previous comments. And I just want to put one slide up that, that takes us back to childhood. Um, well, doesn't take, it takes us to the topic of childhood, not me to my childhood. Uh, these are um, daily samples from a particular time period in the life of one premature baby, as it turns out, between days 5 and uh, 24. And the colors are taxonomic composition based on genus. 
So just from the back of the room, there are three relatively stable states as defined at the genus compositional level. Um, you can see several days with one, a number of days in the middle, and then a number of days at the end. And I won't talk to you about the details here, except to remind you and perhaps lead to Ruth's um, comments about the model that appears to be at least relevant to childhood, early childhood, which is a model of punctuated temporary equilibria. It's a model that's been um, certainly well studied and understood by ecologists and other systems. This is um, a model that might apply to early childhood, but I'm showing you this because in that last, that third state, the one out here, we, um, in, this is in collaboration with Jill Banfield, uh, had an opportunity to, to do deeper sequencing, shotgun sequencing of several time points during this period when it appears there's relative stability, at least at the genus level. And now what we see are very um, significant shifts in the relative abundance of two strains of the same species of Citrobacter in um, divergent manner. The blue one is going down on day 18 and back up by day 21. The yellowish one is increasing in abundance. And these are strains that, that differ by less than, uh, the, say, the 4% overall sequence similarity that was used by Jeremiah, Jeremiah Faith in the last paper I showed you, um, and yet reflect differences that may be functionally important, like deletions in intergenic regions that encode putative um, small RNAs or differences in the abundance or, um, or composition of genes that encode uh, for uh, regulatory elements and adherence factors. So we don't know if this matters, but we wouldn't have known that it even happened were we not to look at the diversity in this way. And this gives us, again, another aspect of, or another feature of, of um, uh, stability. So I'm gonna turn finally to resilience and disturbance and just, again, give you a few highlights. We have tended to think about disturbance as a negative thing, um, something that does harm. Uh, but in fact, from an ecologic point of view, it can do good because it provides opportunity for replacement or for, um, or for uh, uh, various kinds of, of turnover that may be favorable, or at least the potential for, favor, uh, for a favorable outcome. Um, and yet we know that disturbance is, uh, is much more common, we think, in today's world for our microbiota than it used to be. Although, again, um, there may be aspects of lifestyle that we don't fully understand in days gone by, and, and there may have been plenty of disturbance of other sorts. When we talk about resilience, um, we're talking, again, about the capacity of the ecosystem to absorb a disturbance and retain function or structure or some other feature that we think is important. So on this notional uh, landscape uh, scheme, the, 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 the feature of resilience is proportionate to the, the width of the valley. It's also proportionate to the, um, the time for a community to recover from a disturbance, which again, might be the steepness of the valley. So again, just part of the, the imagery here and, and the ideas and concepts I, I often um, turn uh, to, to Buzz Hollings for, for some of the most interesting early um, discussion of what this really means for an ecosystem. Two very quick just snippets of, of data here. Um, this is from a study that Katie Shaleff has been, um, has undertook in my lab, is now writing up. Um, this was a study of, of time series data at four different subgingival pockets in the human mouth. Four of the mouths were healthy, four were diseased with chronic periodontitis. And you can see the time series here begins two weeks prior to a major disturbance and then three months after. And the major disturbance was um, this uh, uh, sort of medieval uh, torture um, uh, event that we all undergo when we go to our dentist and have um, cleaning done and scaling of, of our teeth. So these are the data for um, two mouths, the four sites in each. The red sites are the four sites from a, a periodontitis mouth. The uh, four blue community uh, samples are from a healthy mouth. And these are their positions in, again, two-dimensional space on a co principal coordinates-like plot. Um, and this is their starting position two weeks before. So what then happens is an interesting sort of aspect of dynamics um, which is this, 
This is what's happening over the course of the two weeks before the disturbance. The, um, the disease sites from this one mouth have, have sort of uh, deviated and, and, uh, and moved off to, to the right and upwards, and the blue ones downwards uh, and to the right. So the overall effect of the two-week average data is to define what is a slightly different disease compositional state than, than a healthy one, which may not have been apparent at any one point in time. So now comes the, um, the cleaning. And here's what's happening to these sites. They um, clearly show a disturbance, but a ra relatively rapid recovery. This is seven days now, and even by three days, there was near complete recovery. Um, so what do we learn from data like these? Well, there is not only site specificity to the patterns of diversity, but there's site specificity to the response to the same disturbance. There, in fact, and Katie's now looked at all of the mouths and, and a lot more data, there is um, a larger response or displacement or disturbance at sites with greater clinical disease scores at the start. There is relatively rapid recovery in all cases, um, much to the dismay of, of dentists, um, and, but the possibility that we might be able to predict the likelihood